Stephen and I got to work together at the first part of the administration. And one of the things I just loved about Stephen was he was so uh, committed to his staff and his people. And uh, he would regularly call me about how we could increase their pay. And so Stephen, that's, that's how you, it's one way you get the attention by being a good leader. And so Stephen, thank you so much uh, for your leadership. You know, in reading, uh, if, you, if you look through the, the many biographies of uh, Dr. Chu, uh, you will find that he admits, or he at least claims, to be the underachiever in his family. Now, I don't know about your family, but in most families, uh, winning a Nobel Prize and being Secretary of Energy would probably put you at the top sibling spot. Uh, but you can see the, the, uh, the amazing family that he must uh, come from. The second thing that strikes you about Dr. Chu is how generous he is in giving credit to the many teachers and mentors who developed and encouraged his love of math and physics. The people who gave him the freedom to experiment, explore, and it's something that I know he talks many times about, even fail. And there's great learning in failing. He's giving back to his students in the same way. And as we strive to get more young women and men into the STEM fields, people like Dr. Chu, who teach and who mentor and who spark interest in science and math, are invaluable in that effort. As the first scientist, to serve as the Secretary of Energy, Dr. Chu was responsible for implementing President Obama's ambitious energy agenda. He was given the task of increasing our investment in clean energy, reducing our dependence on foreign oil, and addressing climate change, and in his spare time, create a few million jobs. When President Obama announced Dr. Chu's nomination as Secretary of Energy, he said, quote, the future of our economy and our national security is inextricably linked to one challenge, energy, end quote. Dr. Chu took that challenge very seriously. While he was Secretary of Energy, he was instrumental in pushing the development of alternative energy sources. Under his leadership, the United States doubled, doubled the amount of power generated by renewables. More importantly, he oversaw the opening of the ARPA-E, uh, translated the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy and Energy Innovation Hubs. And ARPA-E has variously been compared to massive green venture capital firm and the laboratory where James Bond gets all of those amazing spy gadgets. So as the Q, in this scenario, Dr. Chu gave the scientists and researchers at those ARPA-E labs the freedom that they had at Bell Labs. He gave them and all the Department of Energy employees the freedom to pursue solutions to our energy problems that were both high risk and potentially very high reward as well. Inspired by people like Dr. Chu, we are now working between the United States and Australia to bring out and increase that innovative spirit in all of us. I can think of few places on the world and the planet better than Australia to talk about solar energy. From government to academia to business, Australians are working hard to take advantage of one of your greatest assets, the Antipodean light. We are taking full advantage of it at our small United States Embassy mission here in Australia. Here in Canberra, we have put solar panels on all of our US government-owned diplomatic housing. Those panels now produce more than 180,000 kilowatt hours of electricity a year. They heat our water, and they have reduced our costs amazingly. In fact, we have received quite a few rewards, uh, awards at the, uh, at the embassy, Stephen. I know uh, you'd appreciate this, both for recycling, for energy saving, and our sustainability programs. And we are proud to be one of the greenest embassies here in Australia. But Australian companies are also looking into better and more affordable solar roofs, both for commercial and residential properties. Mining companies are building solar plants 
to replace diesel in their powering of their minds. In June, President Obama and Prime Minister Tony Abbott announced a cooperative effort between the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the University of New South Wales and the Energy Change Institute here at ANU. Together, we will research the further development of solar uh, voltaic technologies like tandem solar cells and thin film solar cells, which uh, I know you'll hear more about today. We are so fortunate to have had Dr. Chu at the helm of the Department of Energy during a crucial time for the United States. Because of his excellent leadership, we are now closer to energy independence as a nation than we ever have been before. We now have more people employed by the solar industry than we do by the coal industry. And we have encouraged the talents and imaginations of some of the best and brightest minds for the future. Not content to rest on his laurels, or perhaps determined to finally become that family overachiever, Dr. Chu is continuing his impressive research now at Stanford. I'd like to tell you more about that, but as I tried to read through it, it was way undecipherable to me, Stephen, so I'm looking forward to hearing your talk today, and you'll hear it directly from him. I am so pleased that he was able to make his trip to Australia. Uh, he experienced uh, a biking accident on his knee just shortly before he came, and it, was, uh, it is a true testament to both his valor and his persistence uh, that he made the trip, uh, even though uh, uh, that, uh, of that serious accident. So, Stephen, we're so honored to have you here, and it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Chu. So, thank you, John, uh, for that lovely introduction. I have to say, working with John was uh, a real joy. Um, if you didn't get his real title, let me translate it. He was head of HR for the US government. And uh, usually when you have to deal with HR people, you cringe, you know, the hairs in the back of your neck stand up and you say, oh, and you have to weather it. Uh, but, but John was very good. Uh, he was more than very good. He, he, um, he understood that the, what we would do in the government, what any organization do, really, it's all about the people and the quality of people and how to get the best people, and if you get the best people to come, how do you keep them there? And uh, that's what it's about. You absolutely have to do things by the rules, fairly, all those things, but really um, getting people to uh, come and serve at the government. Uh, not everybody is willing to take a factor of five or 10 cut in pay, as I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why I was badgering him to say, maybe we can only ask him to take a factor three cut and pay. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me just push on. And before I talk about solar, I, I have to put it in context. And for all of you in the audience, you, whenever you do something in research, you have to know what the competition is doing in research. And if you, you're in industry, you have to do that. So uh, the question is, what is the competition doing? And what part of the significant competition is um, the fossil fuel, oil, natural gas, and coal. Uh, oil and natural gas particularly are deemed very valuable because uh, oil for transportation especially. And so let me quote uh, two people I respect immensely. And they said, our ability to find and extract fossil fuels continues to improve and economically recoverable reservoirs around the world are likely to keep pace with rising demand for decades. Well, I said that. Uh, <laughs> uh, why? Let me just remind you of US oil production from 1945 to 2012. This chart goes up to 2010. And you see that peak oil production in the United States was about 1970. And despite the Alaskan oil find, that orange stuff, it continued to decline. But then on the extreme right-hand side, there's this little green triangle called tight. This is uh, so-called tight oil that could be released if you fractured it with uh, water. And uh, the following year, tight oil increased to, uh, so that the US production is 7.5 million barrels a day. By the end of this year, it's going to be 8.5 million barrels a day. The increase in tight oil was about 4.5 million barrels a day 
which is more oil than any other country in the world except three, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. More than Venezuela, more than Iraq, more than Iran, more than Canada, more than every other country, just the increase. And uh, it can go higher. So uh, what else is uh, there? Well, um, there may be potential reserves of oil and gas that are perhaps 10 times larger than the rest of the world. Uh, and so where you see brown, you see potential tight oil and gas. Now, tight gas in the United States is no longer being explored uh, actively. You've got high producing wells and gas is now 350 to $4 a million BTU, about one third to one quarter is the rest of the world. Um, and so, in fact, sadly, uh, gas is being flared in North Dakota at a great rate because they want to get after the expensive good stuff, oil, and so they're just burning it uh, because uh, they're interested in short-term profits, not long-term, not total profits. And so this is a real tragedy. Uh, but the point here is that, for example, China may have one and a half times more oil, uh, tight oil, than in the United States, and there are many other countries around the world who do this. Uh, Russia, of course, is aghast at this new source of oil, and they have people around in Europe trying to convince the Europeans that this is really dirty, ugly stuff. It's threatening the water tables, and you shouldn't try to develop uh, gas and oil in Europe. Um, Russia has become a very environmentally conscious country in all countries except Russia. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> let me also say, <laughs> Let me also say that, uh, I, I, although it's not on the topic, I do want to remind you something about uh, the 800-pound gorilla in the room, and, and that is really climate change. But I'm going to introduce it in a slightly different way and only talk about it briefly. Uh, this is a graph of tobacco use in the United States from 1900 to 2005. And the black curve is the average per capita uh, use of cigarettes per male adult. And by 1965, where it peaked, uh, the average uh, consumption of cigarettes was 220 packs uh, a year, including non-smokers. We are a very smoking country, from essentially zero to uh, very large smoking. And by 1950s and certainly by the 60s, that blue curve, uh, the, uh, that same cohort, uh, adult males, dying of lung cancer. And it was beginning to rise considerably above the noise, and the medical community is saying, oh, wow, what's happening? Uh, there seems to be a correlation between uh, cigarette smoking and lung cancer deaths. Uh, the tobacco company said, well, correlation does not mean causation, and since you can't predict who's going to get lung cancer, you don't understand the microbiology of how you get uh, cancer from cigarette smoking, uh, you can't prove it, so what's to worry until you prove it? Kind of sounds familiar. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, the epidemiology pushed on, and by the late, by the mid late sixties, uh, they were able to put warnings on packages of cigarettes. Uh, the Surgeon General said, "Caution: cigarette smoking may be hazardous to your health." Uh, the next Surgeon General said, "Caution: cigarette smoking is hazardous to your health," and he was promptly fired by the next president. But never mind that. Uh, as we went to the 80s and 90s, it, uh, a huge campaign to convince young people not to start smoking uh, ensued, and you see that black curve just going down, 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 losing 60% of consumption per capita. And, and then you see uh, deaths from cigarette smoking going down. I want to point out that there's a 25-year lag. A 25-year lag from the time the average person starts smoking to when they get lung cancer. So they do a lot of damage in this ensuing years. That's not to say if you've been smoking for 25 years and you haven't had lung cancer, you're safe. No. <laughs> it's average. You can get it in five years or you can never get it. Uh, and so science today still can't predict that. Uh, we do know today that uh, if you smoke, and this is very serious epidemiological studies to take all of the other factors that might uh, distort the correlation, uh, if you smoke a half a pack more a day, you have a 25 times higher chance of getting lung cancer than if you didn't smoke. 25 times, not 
uh, and smoking is the greatest cause of premature deaths in the United States that are preventable. Um, we also know that coronary heart disease, stroke, two to four times higher. All right, so hold that thought for a moment. Uh, up, here's some more data, 1850 to 2010. Uh, uh, and you see on that top curve uh, these wiggly lines, and it's the average uh, land and ocean surface temperature. And to most people, you would say that the, uh, those temperatures average over the Earth are increasing. Uh, except a few people in D.C., they look at that and they say, no, it's not increasing. Over the last 15 years, it's been essentially stable. Uh, that's true. If you cherry pick the data, the last 15 years has been essentially stable. Uh, we don't know why it's stable. We don't know why in around 1945 to 1970 you have this long plateau. Uh, we do know why over, a, and that's very complicated having to do with the ocean currents. I don't want to go into this. But certainly over a century, we do know uh, if energy in is the same and energy out is less, there's only one way the temperature is going to go. Uh, because you begin to average all, over all these subtle ocean currents and things. By the way, the lower curve is the rise in sea level. All right, so um, now I'm going to probably tell you something that only the climate experts will know about, and that is um, it turns out that if you're the biochemistry, the chemistry of life is much more selective than inorganic chemistry. And if you're a plant and you, use, you take in carbon dioxide to, uh, in photosynthesis to create uh, the stuff that the plant needs, your preference of taking in carbon-12 is much better than, let's say, carbon being dissolved in the ocean. Uh, and so you're scarfing in carbon-12 and you're preferentially rejecting carbon-13, an isotope of carbon-12. All right. Now, you're a plant, you've got high levels of carbon-12 to carbon-13, yeah, you get fossilized, you go deep underground, you take it up, you burn it, all right? So there's less carbon-13 than carbon-12 when you're burning fossil fuel. And so you look at this difference, and this is called the Zeus effect, and here on the curve, let's see if you have a pointer, uh, where's my pointer? Somewhere by its pointer, but pointer is here. Okay, so this this curve is uh, carbon dioxide increasing from 1750, beginning of the Industrial Revolution to the present time, and the uh, bluish curve, this thing over here, is carbon 13. Uh, this is carbon 13 over carbon 14, uh, and so what you're doing is you're taking massive amounts of carbon that are pre-selected to be more carbon-12 than carbon-13, and you're throwing it back in the atmosphere. And so if you do that, you dilute uh, the carbon-13, which is happening. Quantitatively, it makes sense. It's quantitatively in agreement with how much fossil fuel we burn since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. There's another isotope, carbon-14, uh, which is also an indicator. Uh, carbon-14 is a radioactive form of carbon. It's made in the upper atmosphere with uh, proton bombardment of nitrogen-14. Carbon-14 decays in 5,700 years. It mixes into the atmosphere, it goes, it's incorporated in all living things, you, me, trees, you name it. And uh, suppose you die, and you've got a certain ratio of carbon-14 in your body. And they put you in a coffin for 10,000 years, make it a million years, so that uh, all the carbon-14 in your body is gone. And they dig you up and you put, they put you in a fossil fuel power plant, <laughs> right? You're part of the new energy. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, you don't have any more carbon-14. So if you burn a lot of fossil fuel, you stick up uh, stuff devoid of carbon-14, okay? So it too gets diluted if it's sequestered for millions of years. And here you see the carbon-14 going down as the CO2 goes up. And you say, well, wait. you're you only showed us data to 1950, and so what's going on here? And what's going on is after the 1950s, there was a big perturbation on carbon-14. It was called atmospheric hydrogen bomb testing, and uh, that was a big perturbation. And you see uh, this green curve as uh, the United States and the Soviet Union began to test uh, hydrogen bombs. 
and they in in on land in the atmosphere, this carbon-14 went spiking up like crazy. This, this oscillation, uh, it actually went out of the uh, stratosphere. Um, the limit on the hydrogen bombs was actually defined by, you, we can make them bigger, but if we make them any bigger than 50 or 100 megatons, most of the energy just goes up into space. <laughs> You've just blown too big a hole in the atmosphere. So, but they were testing bombs in the five to 10, up to 50 megaton range. And that's what was happening. These oscillations are, are actually the mixing time between uh, the upper atmosphere and the biosphere. So this tracer carbon-14 allows you to mix it. <clears throat> and you see that since the testing was done in the northern hemisphere, it took, takes about a year and a half for the northern hemisphere to mix. It takes a while for the carbon-14 in the atmosphere to be absorbed by the norm, northern hemisphere ocean and the southern hemisphere ocean. So you see this is going down, this is going up, and then you see this above here. And so that you could say, well, most of it's now working its way into the ocean. No, it's uh, declining too fast. And uh, it, is, it too is consistent with the fact that you're burning lots of fossil fuel you're throwing up carbon-12, devoid of carbon-14, because it was underground for millions of years, uh, and therefore uh, you're diluting the carbon-14. So both carbon-13 and carbon-14 are telling you there's a direct quantitative connection between burning fossil fuel and, and what we see. It's not a natural oscillation between the atmosphere, the land, and the ocean, because those natural oscillations don't do this isotopic mix. So, so, so this is one of the reasons why uh, scientists think that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that's uh, shot up by about 45 uh, percent, especially in the last 50 years, uh, is due to humans. It, it can't be a nice natural cycling. So it, it's got uh, human fingerprints all over it. Uh, it may be your imagination, you say, if you see uh, lots of weird weather, storms, droughts, things like that. Uh, this uh, is tracked by many people, climate scientists, it's tracked uh, by insurance companies, and it's tracked by reinsurance companies. A reinsurance company is a company that insures insurance companies. If there's a big drought, uh, as there was in Australia for a couple of years. Are there are massive hurricanes or typhoons, earthquakes. Uh, a standard insurance company may not have enough cash on hand to pay out the premiums, so they take out insurance. And so the reinsurance companies are particularly anxious about these big events, big weather events. And so they track them. They track tropical storms, floods, and a flood that causes a, a landslide extreme droughts and temperatures and forest fires and crop failures. The, these are all things insured. And they have, uh, what are the events that trigger insurance losses? And from 1850 to 2013, uh, it's increasing. Uh, the only thing that was not increasing were the number of earthquakes. They, small number of statistics, but the earthquakes over that same period were bobbing along and they were steady. All these other things were increasing. So again, this doesn't prove that uh, the warming temperatures are actually, uh, it's a correlation. Now, the climate scientists say, we can't predict hurricanes, we can't predict thunderstorms or tornadoes. We can predict we will see more extreme weathers, but it's a very imprecise prediction. So it's again like the 1950s or 1960s, 1970s in smoking. It's beginning to rise above the noise, all right? Um, this is a cool thing that uh, you should know about. These are two satellites, and they're very uh, in a known polar orbit, and they measure the distance between these two satellites to a few percent of the width of a human hair. Why they want to do this? As the satellites go around the globe, if there's an anomaly in the gravitational attraction of the Earth, it makes the orbit of the satellites bob a little bit. So you can imagine them going like that. And you measure the distance between them, and you can back out change in local gravity. And so there have been, there's a European uh, pair of satellites, there's American pair of satellites. There is on the books and in planning stage an upgrade to this based on actually cold atoms measuring gravity. 
And this can be done perhaps 100 times more sensitively than these guys. And so uh, we'll see what happens. But let me just say what these satellites have been measured. From April 2002 to April 2012, this is Greenland. Can you see my pointer? You cannot see my pointer. This is Greenland over here. And this massive blue is a, a big loss in ice. And so if you look at certain glaciers over here, you see these glaciers, summer, winter, summer, winter, uh, losing ice mass. And uh, it's not only losing ice mass, but it's actually accelerating. Uh, remarkably, you can do everything, but they're in polar orbit. They sample the entire world. Uh, this is the western part of the Antarctic ice sheet, again, losing mass, and again, accelerating. OK. Um, they also can measure water tables, water table changes in California, water table changes in the Midwest water table changes in India and Australia, and uh, they're showing uh, declining water tables. Now, that's not all due to climate change. In fact, most of it is just due to water misuse. But, but uh, they're doing that. All right, so let's go back to the analogy on smoking. Remember that 50-year lag? We don't know what the damage is that we've already done to the greenhouse gases, especially the carbon dioxide we've stuck up in the air. Carbon dioxide. Um, is pretty stable, and, but it's not 25 years. It's probably 50 to 150 years before it glides to the stop. Suppose we stop, the, that is to say, we stop emitting carbon today, what's the final temperature? It would take 50 years, 100 years to find out. Okay, it's like all the mutations that you've been doing to yourself and smoking for the last 10, 20 years, and they're sitting there gathering, gathering, gathering. And actually, lung cancer is a multiple mutation disease. It's not a single point mutation. And so it actually requires constant uh, uh, injury to your cells. All right, so, so we don't know what the real damage is. And we don't know how long the CO2 will remain in the atmosphere. The estimates vary from a few hundred years to a few thousand years. All right, so let's go back. You're an adult, you smoke your decision, okay, whether you want to do that. Um, and uh, the difference is here, we smoke and our grandchildren run the risk. And their grandchildren run the risk, because out to a thousand years. And so, so far society as a whole has been saying, oh, unless you're 100% sure or 90% sure that all this bad stuff may happen, I don't want to give up smoking. And it's not my problem anyway. All right? So, so this, I think, is a problem. <laughs> uh, but it's a problem that society at large has never had to face in the history of humankind. Never has scientists said, what we are doing today will affect what will be happening 500 years, 1,000 years from today. And it's invisible, and, it, and it's going to have to come out of the noise, and it could take a half a century to come out of the noise. So there are huge risks. We don't know exactly what will happen, but the risks are big. All right, another quote. The Stone Age came to an end not for lack of stones, and the Oil Age will come to an end, but not for lack of oil. That was said by Sheikh Yamani, a former Saudi oil minister. Ah, you're chuckling. You think that's why he's the former oil minister. <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, what he went is we transitioned to better solutions. Uh, so you go from the Stone Age to some Metal Age. Um, and you need to transition to better solutions. If you don't find better solutions, and better solutions I mean economically better solutions, uh, the oil, gas, and coal in the ground will be used. If it's the cheaper solution, it will be used. Uh, because if you're Venezuela, uh, if you're Russia, heck, if you're Australia, there's a huge temptation to just pump that stuff out of the ground because that's, that's money. All right. So um, now, solar power. Well, let me just remind you that most energy sources are solar power. Of course, it's solar the way you think of solar PV or solar thermal, but wind is solar power. Uh, uh, hydropower is solar power because it's the sun that makes the water evaporate. Ocean currents are solar power. Uh, fossil energy is solar power that had been stored uh, uh, millions of years ago. Um, fusion 
is solar power, and uh, so is geothermal. Uh, it's a different kind of solar power. It's due to the ability of uh, heavy elements when they radioactively decay to release energy. But I, let me remind you that when supernova explode, they make a lot of heavy elements and radioactive heavy elements. And so it's a different form of solar power, but it's solar power. Uh, the only exceptions are tidal power. Uh, it's largely gravity gradients of the moon. And fusion power, not in the sun, that's clearly solar power, but terrestrial fusion power if we ever get it. Uh, why is that? Again, to remind you, uh, this is an incredible understanding of uh, the early epochs in the universe, and this is time in seconds on a log scale. That's one second, 100 seconds, 1,000 seconds, 10 to the fourth seconds. And uh, we are, we're able to predict uh, the abundance of the light elements due to what we know about physics and the early moments in the universe. And what we see is the time evolution of hydrogen, helium, deuterium, tritium, beryllium, lithium, and so on. The tritium uh, all decays away. Deuterium is stable. Uh, the universe is 25% helium, a remarkable prediction. Uh, but all these other predictions have landed right on the money. Okay? But when we do fusion, what we do is we take beryllium and lithium, we breed it into tritium, we combine it with deuterium, and we make fusion. But where do we get that from? We get uh, the beryllium and the lithium from. Uh, the creation of the universe. So that's, so that's not solar power. <laughs> um, so those are the reactions we use. Uh, you know, it's heavy water and heavier water. Uh, this is uh, hydrogen dioxide, tritium dioxide, and deuterium dioxide. It does weigh more. This is, these are just scales. <laughs> um, all right, so I uh, went through this, I think. Um, I don't know why I'm, oh, good. That means I'm, my talk will be faster. Uh, let me talk about, clean, first, first, before I do that, uh, I just want to mention that about half of the carbon decrease will have to come from energy efficiency and should come from energy efficiency because energy efficiency is really the lowest cost option. It not only saves on carbon, but it saves money. Um, and it just means that you, one has to do things in a smart way. But I'm, since this is a solar conference, I'm going to talk about uh, energy and particularly solar energy. This is a chart of um, the dark blue or purple is the cost in the United States of various forms of energy. Uh, the cheapest today, oh, and this is the cost of new sources of energy. If you want to put in a new gas plant, and, and amortized over the lifetime of the plant 50 years or so, and the cost of natural gas and the operating cost of everything else. Uh, natural gas is the cheapest in the United States, and we're assuming that natural gas stays at $4 a million BTU. Uh, the Asian market is about $15 to $18 a million BTU. In Europe, it's uh, about $15. The United States is anomaly low, and because of that, uh, Natural gas is the cheapest form of energy in the United States. Uh, onshore wind is going to pass natural gas, including transmission of onshore wind, within five years. With the subsidy we have, it's cheaper than natural gas today by about 30%. That subsidy is going to be ramped down, turned off in the next couple of years. But uh, for good reason, uh, wind doesn't need it anymore. In the next five, certainly 10 years, it won't need it. Uh, large solar PV, uh, solar thermal, you see them up higher. Oh, those lines there are uh, wholesale electricity costs, $50 a megawatt hour, $70 a megawatt hour. Very, very inexpensive. Um, and the point here is that renewable energy, uh, large scale solar and uh, onshore wind will get within a few percent of that within a decade. Very, very good news. Um, uh, so that's where I think uh, without subsidy, these things will be in less than 10 years. Uh, nuclear is more expensive in the United States because uh, unless we know how to build plants on time on budget, uh, and coal is significantly more expensive in the United States, and that's why we're no longer building coal plants. Natural gas is just too, too uh, low a cost. Um, uh, what are the orange things? 
The orange things have to do with the actual cost to society of emitting carbon dioxide, depending on how you cost it, whether it's low, medium, or high CO2 costs. And so just think of the natural gas being shifted to the right by those blocks or coal being shifted to the right and everything else. So, so the real cost to society in air pollution, and it's only a rough guesstimate of what the cost to society will be in climate change, uh, you begin to shift everything to the right. So if you consider the real cost, uh, they're already cheaper. But even without that, it's, it's getting within striking distance. Solar, huge success story over, since the middle 70s, over the last 40 years. Uh, the price of solar modules has declined by about a factor of 40. Uh, there was a, uh, this is called a learning curve. Every time you increase production or shipments, Deployment by a factor of 10, the price goes down by a certain fraction. Another factor of 10, it goes down by another fraction. As the cost comes down, the deployment increases. And so it's true of virtually all technologies that they follow a straight line. If, if you plot it as the log of the uh, uh, shipments out and the log of the price. And, uh, but this doesn't have follow a completely straight line because there was a, uh, a very attractive feed-in tariff started in Germany that actually drove the cost of solar modules down uh, because it drew a huge demand and so then you start to make more. Uh, but it also got a lot of people interested, particularly in China, so they started uh, investing in multi-billion dollar solar plants. Uh, and there was an overcapacity, there was a shortage of silicon, and over, uh, the shortage of silicon made the price go up, and China got into the action, and uh, there was an overcapacity, and the bottom fell out of the market. And so many uh, large companies in Germany, a few in the United States, and a couple in China went bankrupt. The largest solar company in China went bankrupt. Um, and so the bottom fell out of the market. Uh, they were trying to sell at below cost in this period down here uh, because uh, they had sunk costs. So they had to recover something. And this, the expression in those days was, well, you're losing every time you sell a solar module, but, what you, uh, but you make that up in volume. <laughs> in any case. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the market is stabilized over the last year. It will probably remain stable, maybe for a year or two, but it will go down after that. Um, most manufacturers are get, making through this bulge and, and they're still driving down costs. And so that green dot is where we think solar modules will be sold for at a profit, 50 cents a watt instead of $20 a watt. Uh, so that's a big, big change in reduction in costs. Uh, right now, the solar manufacturers are making at cost, the manufacturing cost is 50 cents a watt today. And they're selling for 80 cents, so it's marginal profit. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, we uh, revitalized our solar program in, in the Department of Energy. We said, how good can things get? And so uh, we started this in 2006 and 8. We noticed the system prices and the goal was to get uh, solar uh, to be comparable to natural gas um, without subsidy. We thought a dollar watt was realizable, and so we broke the cost down, starting in 2010 prices, which are over here. Uh, this is the solar module. These are, uh, the green is the solar module, the orange is the balance of the system, and, and there's a little sliver you can't really, uh, the power electronics is that little sliver. And then we said, okay, how, how much can you really reduce things? And ideally, you could reduce them so that the module cost would be 50 cents a watt. This is a target of 2020. The balance of the system, 40 cents, and everything, everything else, 10 cents. Uh, 50 cents, we're going to get there. Absolutely, positively. When we put this out, the solar manufacturers said, you guys must be smoking something over there in the Department of Energy. Uh, and uh, we said no, and we discussed it with him. And two years later, Dick Swanson, who founded one of the, a very successful silicon photo company, said in a public talk, he said, it's unbelievable. The Department of Energy actually sat with us, told us how to think again about the business model, and then we decided they were right. <laughs> 
<laughs> and then everyone else decided they were right, and then it became a race to see to get those manufacturing costs down, and, and that's what's happening. So that's a good thing. I should say that module efficiency improvements is a big deal, because if you go, the polysilicon modules a few years ago was roughly 15, 16% efficient. They're now going to 18, 19% uh, cent efficient. The silicon ones are now at 20, 21, 22% efficient. If you increase the efficiency, going from 15 to 20 percent, that's three over 15. That's a huge fractional change, and so the land use, the roof use, and every, the installation costs all scale. So everything else shrinks. So if you're you're in the solar module or solar cell technology research business, everything does scale with the cost of the efficiency, especially at rooftop. Um, another thing I want to point out this is uh, the solar spectrum at the top of the Earth. Uh, this is the solar spectrum at the latitudes, typically where you find uh, land that makes sense to where you have solar. So this is not land in upper Siberia. Uh, this is land in, in the United States uh, and in uh, Southern Europe and places like that. And so, um, looky here. This, this, is all, this is where the visible light is and all this stuff you can't see. And so there lies an opportunity to actually make uh, solar films uh, that keep windows uh, mostly transparent, and you can still get a lot of energy, if you can figure out how to do that. Um, lots of things are happening. The prices of silicon, polysilicon, cad telluride are, are, are jumping down like crazy. Uh, there's a new set of materials only in the last 10 years, proskovites, uh, that is, is coming down like crazy. Um, it's uh, now at 15 percent, 18 percent, and um, uh, there's a talk uh, in this conference uh, that described how you can use uh, silicon, which will remain inexpensive for a very long time, with proskovites to get over 30 percent efficiency, and that's uh, a pretty realistic goal. So that's all very exciting. Uh, for those young people in the audience, I'm going to remind you. Uh, I'm going to use an analogy on how solar works. Think of rain being those photons hitting a solar panel. And so your solar panel is this big bucket. And the rain goes in, and, and the photons come in. They create electron holes. And the electron holes are collected, and a voltage is built up across this. You've adjusted things so you can generate a voltage. A voltage related to water is a pressure. So you can get higher and higher voltage the more photons come in. Um, but in the end, you want to tap that voltage, and you want to turn it a little turbine, and so you want to drive things and produce energy. Uh, the bucket can be leaky, so, so that uh, this, these precious photons or electron hole pairs can leak out in surface recombination. They can leak out as bulk recombination. They can do all sorts of things. But in the end, you're collecting this, you're producing a voltage, and you're using this current to generate something. Now, there's an optimum. How do you want to run the solar panel? If you have a large current, you, you say, ah, I can really spin the wheel. But uh, if, you let, if you want to spin this wheel very fast, the voltage is very small, and then there's no pressure. Okay, so this, is, uh, this limit's very inefficient. Uh, the, you know, there's, a, there's no pressure to actually force the turbine. Uh, if you throttle back, you have a very high voltage, but there's a little stream, and you can't really force the turbine. So there's this happy medium. And the happy medium, uh, you can easily say, where its power is voltage times current. And you look at the voltage current curve of the photocell, and you find out how to maximize that. And, and in designing the photocells, that's what you're always thinking about. What is the voltage going to be, and, and what current can you sustain? But now, people who make photocells know this. And most of the people, the engineers and scientists who are in the photovoltaic business are thinking about all these things, clever ways, new designs, new materials, things like that. Uh, but let me tell you things that you might not be thinking about. I certainly was not thinking about it until it became Secretary of Energy. Here you have solar cell, and then it's hooked up in series to another one, another one, another one. And so in series, you get a big high voltage between this solar cell panel and this solar cell panel. You take that DC voltage, and you convert it to AC. And that's good, because these electronics are pretty expensive. And they're actually less reliable than the panels. 
And so that's what happens. But imagine a leaf falls on theirs, or a bunch of clouds fall in this section of the solar panels, or maybe a defect in this panel. The current has to go through all of these. So the current through each of the panels is constant. If one of the panels is defective or has leaves on it or a cloud over it, it limits the current. And so all of them suffer. And so as a minimum, you want to have a converter for each panel and then put them up and add them in parallel. And so up until very recently, that was not done. Uh, when you start doing that, you actually increase the efficiency of the solar panels by 20, 30, 50% in actual field use. People will not put a solar set of solar panels on a roof that has a partial shade. It just is not even worth it, all right? So here's the thing. What you'd like to do is divide these panels into sub-panels so that really inexpensive integrated electronics built into the panel can actually do the inversion, get it up to the voltage so you don't have to do the series again. You don't have to use the whole panel. The panels are this big. And so if there's a defective part of the panel, it just gracefully gets out of the picture, okay? That's something in power electronics, but most electrical engineers don't know that this is a problem worth working on or that they can be very, very rich if they solve the problem. So, <laughs> listen. <laughs> uh, uh, because this problem is eminently solvable. It is a electronics, okay? And electronics, we know how to do. Uh, you can start to unpackage what actually goes into the efficiency of a solar cell. These are the valence electrons. A photon comes in, and it promotes an electron up to the conduction band. You've got a hole down here, and it can be either from the top or somewhere down here. Uh, the hole quickly relaxes to the top up here, like a bubble coming to the surface, and the electron quickly relaxes to the bottom here. So all those relaxations is just lost. Uh, but it's worse than that because it also depends on the effective energy gap, not this energy gap, uh, theoretical energy gap. And this effective energy gap actually likes it to have more intensity on the solar panels, okay? And there are other things. There's the fact, uh, so if you, uh, and this is a nice review article that unpackages all of these things. Uh, there's entropy losses, there's losses to all these things, and Carnot cycles, all this stuff. And so one of the things that uh, uh, good scientists are looking at is look at everything on the menu. Can you, can you improve on these things? So it's just not a magic material list. It, it's all sorts of things, light trapping, ways of eliminating all this. So that's all good stuff. Uh, now, let's see. Uh, radical new ideas. Um, solar cells uh, at high temperature. Uh, don't work as well because when you have high temperature, you create a lot of phonons and the electron holes scatter from the phonons and then they're lost. And so you, you're not, you, you know, in a hot desert where it's 40 degrees centigrade uh, and you've got the sunshine, right, there's a tendency to get warm. And so there's an issue of cooling uh, the solar panels when they're hot. And so uh, a number of researchers said, well, let's use this to our advantage. Uh, you can use in micro and nanolithography, you can make vacuums in here. And so here the photon goes in uh, and uh, it creates an electron hole pair, but you're also using the heat to make it more likely. The heat means that there's a thermal tail of these electrons and you can make it more likely that you can actually get the electrons out. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a mixture of thermionic emission or, or heat-assisted uh, photo excitation. It's, an, it's a new approach. There are materials that do this. Whether it's ever going to be competitive with silicon, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's there. So there are many, many things like that that people are exploring. Uh, this is a solar map of the United States. Uh, you, anything in orange and red, which covers two-thirds of the United States, has fantastic solar. Um, uh, Alaska is blue and a little bit of orange is blue down here. It's not so good. It's comparable to Germany. <laughs> uh, but actually, uh, now Germany actually is about four or five percent solar. And, and so even when the sun is not so good, it, it can be uh, pretty effective. But in places, now Australia is actually, central Australia is even better than this. 
<laughs> you know, Australia has probably got the best solar reserves of anybody except possibly some certain sections of North Africa. Um, what about installation of solar? Um, it turns out that there are a number of companies, and these are some of the companies, Solar City, Sunrun, Sun Power, and they go and they knock on someone's door, uh, it's happening all over California, and they say, we want to sell you electricity. Uh, you loan us your roof so we can put solar on your roof, but it, it's ours. You don't have to pay for it. If it breaks, we fix it, and uh, we'll buy electricity from electrical companies, so you're, you're guaranteed electricity, but you just sign a contract. 20 years, 15 years, if you sell the house, there's, that's fine. There are ways to you know, figure, figure that out. Uh, and so that's all, you just launch your roof and uh, we'll sell you, let's see, if you live in Los Angeles and you are a medium user, instead of paying 15, 18 cents a kilowatt hour average, uh, it's half the rate. The contract would be nine cents a kilowatt hour. So, but you don't have no out-of-pocket expense. You're just paying for electricity. And so this new business model is made possible by two things. The fact that solar is becoming very, very inexpensive, especially in sunny places like Palo Alto or, or Los Angeles, Arizona, and the fact that there's what's called an investment tax credit. That company gets 3% of the investment it takes to buy the modules, the inverters, and install it uh, back the first year. Okay. Now, the investment tax credit expires 2016, the end of 2016. I think you should let it ramp down to 10% instead of 30%. In the United States, everybody gets 10%. Uh, but by 2020, I think for sure, you don't need any special privileges because it will be so inexpensive. Uh, and so that's another thing. So the modules are coming down, the inverters are coming down, but very slowly, because we just need a bunch of smart engineers and more competition. But then there are things called soft costs, and they're not coming down very much at all. And so let me, before I tell you what a soft cost is, let me quote Min Lee, who's the program manager of SunShot in DOE. Unlike physics, where we can fundamentally figure out the upper limit for efficiency of solar cells, there's no such limit to bureaucracy. <laughs> and having been head of the Department of Energy for four and a quarter years, I can absolutely attest to that. <laughs> and so can John Barry. Uh, it's, um, and what that means, it has nothing to do with the cost of the module, the electronics, and even the installation costs, it has to do with inspection fees, licensing fees, and all these other things. Um, right now, it costs about $2 a watt. A $2 a watt means there's a certain panel of a certain size, a certain efficiency, and a certain illumination. So you're taking out whether it's in Germany or in Arizona or, or in Australia. You just say, this is the size of the solar panel and its efficiency. It costs $2 a watt to install in Germany. It's an online application. It's automated. Uh, there's a minor inspection after it's all done, but the uh, county or the city doesn't inspect your roof before you install it and doesn't uh, do things after you install it. They just inspect the electronics. Um, in the United States, uh, you have to have an online, it's not an online application, it's an in person application. You stand on very long lines. Uh, you pay thousands of dollars, and then you have to pay uh, the county inspector to inspect your roof to see if your roof is okay. And after they install it, then the county inspector comes out and has to inspect that the, your roof won't leak, and it too is okay. And then someone else inspects the electrical hookup. And so the county makes several thousand dollars on this. And so when I was at Department of Energy in the last two years, we realized the soft costs are now two-thirds the installation, the non-module costs are two-thirds the cost of solar on a rooftop, and the soft costs are coming to be one-third. Well, that's crazy, I said. Why don't you, know, the, you, this city or this town or municipality say, make money the old-fashioned way. You need income. Do it with speed traps and parking tickets. Leave, <laughs> leave solar alone. This worked in Massachusetts, and suddenly the soft costs came down 50 cents a lot. And they're at 350. California, we couldn't make them budge. They're still four bucks, okay? And and they can go down another 50 cents just by saying, "Hey, don't view solar as a source of income to the city." Uh, but there's something else. 
because it was installation costs. So he said, well, of course German labor is more expensive than American labor, not. <laughs> so what's going on? Uh, so we videotaped them. Golly, they spent one third of the time on the roof as American laborers. So I said, we can understand this technology and import it, okay? And what you do is you get someone uh, skilled in putting the frame, and that's all they do. Boom, they're on to the next roof. And someone slaps on the thing, boom, he's gone. And someone puts in the wiring, boom, they're gone. They make it into an assembly line, okay? Instead of one person doing it all, oh, let's see, I've got to read the book, how do I do this now, how do you do that? And so, so uh, they, they can install it much more quickly because they're using sensible business practices. Um, in Australia, this is 2009, uh, again, uh, if you look at the key, this is the cost of the panel, this is the cost of profits, inverters, the racks, essentially everything else. In 2013, look at the cost of the panel compared to the cost of everything else. It's ridiculous, okay? So the inventors of solar panels were doing a great job. The inventors of installation were doing a lousy job. <laughs> and the, the electric engineers didn't know they should pay attention to inverters, okay? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all right? So uh, in terms of policy, uh, you have to look at the whole package uh, in order to lower the cost. It's just not the solar panel. All right, so here's an energy quiz. Uh, reliable electrical grid cannot tolerate more than 5 or 10% intermittent renewable energy. How many believe that once you go over 10% solar or solar plus wind, the show is over in the sense it gets much more expensive? If you're at 10%, you need 10% more backup power, which should be included in the cost of the energy. So, so true. how many people think this is true? How many people think it's false? Okay. Well, you, the Hawaiian Electrical Company disagrees with you violently. <laughs> in 2013, um, when the integrated solar in Hawaii was at 3 and 4%, but racing up rapidly because it was getting cheap, cheaper than what? Well, Hawaii generates electricity by burning diesel fuel or bunker oil. It costs 39 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity in Hawaii. I don't know if you know what your rates are, but that, let, let me tell you, that's a high rate. Uh, and, uh, and they said, no, the grid can't handle more than 2 or 3%, 3% uh, average power. That means peak, it could be 8%. Uh, it grows unstable. We're responsible for maintaining the grid. And uh, some and reporter from Forbes magazine uh, was interviewing me about solar power and about stuff like that. And I was no longer Secretary of Energy, so I was released from... Uh, remaining silent, and I said, well, that's just plain BS. <laughs> I said, when it's 3%, yes, but not 3%. And uh, a wine electric company uh, got very angry at me. Um, they uh, may have taken a contract down on me, I don't know. <laughs> but why was I so sure? Well, because there's what are called existence proofs in Europe. Uh, as Germany is about 30% renewable, of which uh, it's mostly wind uh, with about 4% solar, and the other is bio. Denmark's 33. Spain is 25%, 21% wind, 4% solar. Spain is not connected to the European grid in any substantial way. It's got the Pyrenees, and it's got French electricity not wanting a renewable energy into France. So, so because of that, there's only a very thin tie. Spain is actually a standalone entity. Ireland is mostly a standalone entity. There are a few undersea cables, but not many. And so if you look down the list, and those green arrows are that list, and there you see on the left-hand side the fraction of non of renewables, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100%. Norway is actually over 100% renewables. It's all hydro. They sell their electric excess electricity to the continental United, uh, Europe. And um, those, those green arrows going down to 10% are those countries that essentially have no hydro pump storage or very little pump storage, uh, no hydro power. Uh, so we're talking wind and solar, which are intermittent. And so we have existence proofs at 20, 25% uh, 
uh, that you can manage your grid without blackouts, brownouts, without load shedding. Now, these countries want to go to 50%. And they have to, at 50%, they have to start sharing energy. And at 50%, you actually have to start thinking of, of pumped hydro and batteries and all sorts of other things. But at 20, 25%, it's manageable, it's already been done. So that was the existence proof. If uh, the policymakers and the regulators only listen to the utility companies and don't know about what's happening in some other part of the world, the utility companies say, we're the experts we know. Don't listen to these scientists or these environmentalists. They are just blowing hot air. Uh, then uh, it, is, it is possible. But let me say that careful planning is essential for this. Once you go over about 10%, you have to actually plan it. You have to manage two-way flows. There has to be some way of doing some things. And when you're at 20%, it gets even more important. Uh, what is the careful planning? OK. Suppose you're, let's say, 30% renewables. First, if you're a big country like Australia, you're, you're good. The United States, China, all perfect. All of continental Europe and North Africa are perfect. But, so, but take a single place like Australia, you have sun in lots of places, this wide area. So clouds over here don't affect something over here. Wind over here doesn't affect wind over there. But you need transmission lines to bring that to the other places. So transmission is, uh, actually becomes a big help for spreading out the variability. Load management is another big deal. Load management means um, you don't run defrost cycles in the middle of the day where electricity is most precious. A defrost cycle is you blow hot air into your freezer and you defrost the full sheen, sheen and then you recool your refrigerator. Uh, you do this at night when energy is cheap. Uh, if it's a really hot day uh, and the price of electricity starts, the real cost of electricity, but you, you now begin to use all your spare capacity goes up, you want to do load management. You say, turn, let your thermostats go up a little, stuff like that. Uh, you have to have automatic two-way flows. The United States does not have automatic two-way flows in the western part of the United States. When there was a blackout in San Diego, people were calling from one electrical district to another and say, hey, Joe, got any extra electricity? Can you send me some? OK? Um, or they would call up a hydroelectric dam and say, can you let some more water through? Because you know we, we, don't have, we lost the generating capacity over here. It was manual. It was manual by phone. <laughs> in the 21st century, OK? And this uh, should not be. Um, energy stores, starting with pump stores, but batteries, and batteries are going to get cheap. And then finally, the last thing is extra standby capacity. When solar becomes 50% or six, not solar, renewables, solar and wind, become 50, 60, 70%, that standby capacity uh, is part of the cost of renewable energy. Let's make note about it. Even at 30%, it is. All right. So now, why in the United States and in other countries uh, are they fighting it? Uh, and let me say that um, if I were a utility company and I get yelled at if there's a blackout, I will want something where I can, it's an old technology, I can turn up the power when there's demand, and I can turn down when there's not demand. That's called fossil fuel and to a certain extent nuclear. But if there's demand and the wind stops shining, or the, or the wind stops blowing and the sun stops shining, uh, that's bad. And so you actually have to think a little bit harder. You have to actually think a lot harder. And if you're a utility company, a guaranteed monopoly, um, you have not gone into utility business because you're a brilliant engineer. Uh, study well at Stanford at the top of the class and say, I want to work for a utility company. <laughs> you want to work for Apple and Google and Facebook? No, you don't want to work for PG&E. Uh, and so there's an issue here about uh, the selection of the people who operate as utility companies. But to be fair to them, <laughs> it's a selection effect. <laughs> uh, uh, guaranteed monopolies don't usually be the most innovative people. <laughs> That's a kind of a Darwinism fact. <laughs> but, um, but uh, and so it's up to think tanks, it's up to others, it's up to innovative utility companies to show that you can be more profitable if you think harder. Because in the end, it's the profit that's the motivation. And, and then if you're a regulator, you have to know about these existence proofs, deployed existence proofs. 
not some theoretical study done in a university. A deployed existence proof is the only thing that actually can convince the utility that it might be operational. And so that's also very important. Here's another quiz. I'm a professor, I give quizzes. Electric vehicles will never be cost competitive because of the high cost of batteries. How many believe this is true? How many believe that's false? Okay, it is false. But let me just tell you, uh, we have in the United States a Tesla. Um, but let me compare it to the Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost. This is this had the second longest production run of any car in the world, almost two decades. Uh, in, when it was introduced, it cost 1,500 pounds. Uh, 1,500 pounds, if you had a professional, 10-year salary could buy you one of these babies. And um, it was great. It, it actually got over 20 miles a gallon. It was a seven liter engine that got uh, 48 horsepower, but it was very smooth. It was a Rolls. <laughs> and uh, very quiet, very smooth, and it, it did this 15,000 mile run that showed it could last. It wouldn't break down. And so by 1911, the technology was there except for one thing, it was just too expensive. And um, uh, by the way, the seven liter 48 horsepower engine was really, really a good thing in those days. Nowadays, one liter gives you 140 horsepower. Okay, and less emissions. <laughs> so we have made progress. Um, uh, and so what really changed uh, transportation was the Model T. It was the longest production run of any car in the world. And Henry Ford said, I want to make this affordable to the vast majority of Americans. And it was this Model T that took uh, the United States from the horse and buggy whip era into the automobile era. So if you want to think electric vehicles, you can think Tesla, which is without subsidy about $120,000 for the long range version. Uh, you have to think $20,000, $25,000 for a 300 mile version and charge in 20 minutes. You don't want to charge in four hours. And so that's the challenge. The cost of the battery, 2008, 1,000 bucks a kilowatt hour, Tesla, 78 kilowatt hours, $78,000 for just the battery manufacturing. Okay, by 2012 it was cut in half. Now it's $40,000. Still a lot of money for a car you're selling for $120,000, well, again, sand subsidy. And so in 2011 we set as a goal, can you make uh, a manufacturing cost, an automobile battery pack, the whole unit, for $160? dollars a kilowatt hour, not 500. And with that price, you can sell a car for 300 miles, a Tesla S range car for um, $25,000. And uh, utility scale can even get $100 a kilowatt hour because at $100 a kilowatt hour, it begins to be comparable to hydropower. And, and so uh, that's for utility scale. How are we doing? We're doing pretty good. This is Bloomberg New Energy Finance projection the, the solid curve, those X's are the actual costs as we enter into, uh, go past, you know, uh, the 2012, 2013, the beginning of 2014, and the costs are coming down. Uh, the Tesla battery is actually 3% cheaper than the Nissan Leaf battery. Uh, and uh, the Gigafactory will be down here, uh, turning operational in 2017, 2018 at the latest. So the costs are coming down, and we're actually maybe faster than the Department of Energy target. Very, very exciting. Utility scale also coming down dramatically. Uh, this company is starting to put them into uh, testing. Uh, their target manufacturing cost uh, is this, but that's for today's battery. Um, higher demand, they're going to have to last 30 years. Um, and uh, without any maintenance to be utility scale. But, but these things are happening. There are two or three companies that think they can manage. Uh, I should say that uh, there's new research going on. This, the other stuff was incremental research. Um, uh, when I got back to Stanford, I started collaborating with a professor, Yi Shui, in mechanical engineering. Uh, there he is. He's one of the star professors, rising professors at uh, Stanford, and what we're working on is not a lithium uh, uh, 
a standard lithium battery with a carbon anode uh, or a silicon anode. And the silicon anode he developed, and this a company is making these things, but uh, a solid metal lithium sulfur battery where we think that uh, the energy density could be four or five times greater. Uh, the charging rate conservatively can be, if it's some tricks, uh, eight, maybe 10 times faster and uh, much safer. And so uh, you couldn't use lithium metal before. Uh, if you char charge it too fast, you get dendrites and short out the battery. And this is an example of a paper we just submitted last week. Now this is the third paper where the uh, open circles are what happens to a lithium metal and the solid ones are what happens to this new method. Uh, uh, we just stopped testing after 120, 130 cycles because that's a few months testing. And uh, so, uh, but there are several approaches. Uh, we're looking at all of them in parallel to see what will happen. Stay tuned, you'll we'll know in a year or two whether you can get something that could be that $100 battery uh, and be one quarter the volume of the Tesla battery and then one quarter the weight. Okay, uh, I'm gonna skip about uh, utilities and low volume costs and all these other things. I just say that we need new business models. Uh, I will say that, especially in Europe, that summer winter storage is a real issue. It's also true in north, uh, the northern part of the United States. It may not be true in Australia. Um, but you can't rely on North Africa as your solar source because if you get cut off from electricity due to some political instability in North Africa, the lights go off. And so, um, uh, uh, so people would not be willing to do that. But suppose, as we see, as I hope to convince you, that uh, renewable energy, wind and solar, become cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. 20 years from today, it will be cheaper than coal and natural gas. Uh, as I said, the United States is very cheaper than coal. Uh, and uh, you, so you have cheap electricity. If you can take carbon dioxide and you can split water cheaply to make hydrogen and combine those two things to make a liquid hydrocarbon fuel, then the problem is solved. Because you could put a liquid hydrocarbon fuel on a tanker and ship it anywhere around the world. We ship oil everywhere around the world and the ship, you know, it's 80, $100 a barrel, the shipping costs are a few dollars a barrel. And you put them in storage tanks, 90 day, 100 day reserves. So you have some energy security. Okay, that technology exists. Tanker fleets and storage tank exist. What doesn't exist is this ability to take cheap electricity and nighttime electricity and turn it into a liquid hydrocarbon fuel. If you do that, uh, then the renewable energy problem, then you start, then I see 100% renewables and energy security and everything else. So that's the last thing we need. And let me just close by saying um, the part of the things I like least about being a Secretary of Energy is the press. They're venal, they're trying to trap them like gotcha. And eventually, I told the president uh, after the election that I, I really enjoy working with him. I'd love to stay two more years, but my wife had other ideas and she was going back to California and she said, Steve, no one's irreplaceable, not even you. <laughs> and I'm going back to California. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm coming. And <laughs> uh, so, so on February 1, I announced that I was stepping down. And in February 7, uh, the following news story appeared. <laughs> Hungover Energy Secretary wakes up next to solar panel. <laughs> now, I'm going to read you part of the byline. Washington, um, sources have reported that following a long night of carousing at a series of DC watering holes, Energy Secretary Stephen Chu awoke Thursday morning to find himself sleeping next to a giant solar panel he had met the previous evening. <laughs> According to sources, I went on to allege, I didn't even remember the manufacturer's name. <laughs> <laughs> According to sources, Chu's encounter with the crystalline silicon solar receptor was his most regrettable dalliance since 2009, when an extended fling with a 90-foot wind turbine nearly ended his marriage. <laughs> so I walk in and work morning of February 7th. 
my public affairs, the head of public affairs comes to me and says, we gotta answer this. And I said, yes. <laughs> we normally don't uh, answer salacious news stories. Uh, it, it's just not worth it because it, then it creates the thing that press love. But so by noon, we issued the following statement. I just want everyone to know that my decision not to serve a second term as energy secretary has absolutely nothing to do with the allegations made in this week's edition of The Onion. While I'm not going to confirm or deny the charges specifically, I will say that clean renewable solar power is a growing source of US jobs and it's becoming more and more affordable, so it's no surprise that lots of Americans are falling in love with solar. <laughs> now, There were limits to what they allow me to say, because I could say, regards of your sexual orientation and things like that. <laughs> but in any case, uh, uh, the future of solar looks bright. There's a huge amount of technology that can be developed. I urge everybody to pay attention to the whole problem, uh, not only this, uh, the guts of the PV, but the whole system, and not only the whole solar system, but how it integrates with the current transmission distribution system, and know that batteries within five to 10 years at the outset will become very, very inexpensive. That can do uh, peak shifting from noontime to four to 10 o'clock at night. And uh, all these things are happening within a decade. The, most of the distribution systems are not planning for it. And you have to plan for it because this is, you need some serious technology in order to capture the low cost solution. Otherwise, we don't do the low-cost solution. We do the more expensive solution. And the low-cost solution includes all that other residual grid uh, coordination stuff. So, so anyway, with that, uh, let me conclude. And uh, I'm not sure what else I'm supposed to do. Thank you.